Welcome to the EVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of EVO. And we're so pleased to have you here with us for our Yiddish Civilization Lecture Series. Um, today's talk, Who Says Opera is Always Long? Opera Excerpts for Yiddish Speakers in Early 20th Century America will be led by Daniela Smolov-Levy. Um, before we get started, just a very brief word about EVO. Um, YIVO is a very special place for the celebration and contemplation of Jewish history and Jewish culture. We have a library and archive with over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books, which are used by researchers from around the world. Um, we bring to life the worlds of these collections with our public programs, with our um, classes, and with our exhibitions, um, and much more. This particular program is a part of our Yiddish Civilization Lecture Series, which is a wing of our Uri Levinreich program in Yiddish language, literature, and culture, which is our summer Yiddish instruction program. We have actually two programs running simultaneously, one in person and also one online. Um, and we have scores of Yiddish students with us from around the world studying Yiddish. Um, and we have this lecture series as a way to help us bring the, the world of that program to the wider public. So we have our students watching with us right now, as well as the public. So thank you all so much for joining us. Daniela Smolov-Levy is a musicologist who studies the history of popularly oriented opera in America. She's currently a research fellow working remotely at Tel Aviv University as part of a collaborative project that explores early 20th century popular Yiddish theater. She's also a research fellow at UCLA, organizing a series of talks leading up to a conference in 2024 on the topic of Jews and cultural boundaries in music, theater, and film in America. Daniela is currently working on a book about Yiddish speakers' engagement with opera in early 20th century America. She holds a doctorate in musicology from Stanford University, a master's degree in piano performance from New York University, and a bachelor's degree in comparative literature and music from Princeton University. Daniela, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be able to share this research. Um, and I want to extend a big thank you to Yivo, not just for inviting me, but also for being such an incredible rep repository of materials. As Alex said, I don't think I've ever given a single talk that hasn't somehow drawn on these materials. So um, materials from Yivo. This talk is no, no exception. So I want to begin by sharing my screen so you can see my presentation. Okay, here it is. Everybody can see the screen i hope yes looks great great thank you okay all right so who says opera is always long opera excerpts for yiddish speakers in early 20th century america so when we think of opera we often think of something long maybe boring or something that's maybe for elites uh expensive snobby snooty has kind of a bad rap today it's not really often part of the cultural conversation but as many of you probably know, and as this talk will show, it really was an integral part of a wide range of um, cultural spheres and cultural publics from um, many different social classes and in many different backgrounds. What's interesting about this world of opera and its reputation that it has today is that this reputation really only began to develop in the late 19th century. And it functioned in tension with opera's popularity for several decades before the elite reputation that we now associate with opera won out as new forms of popular culture emerged. There's perhaps been no form of popular culture that has not eventually been replaced by some other form of popular culture. And so the status of these cultural forms changes as we go through time. Uh, but really into the early and even the, some of the mid 20th century America opera really was an important part of popular culture and had not only not only lead audiences, but also middle and working class audiences as well. There were, as there are today, uh, lots of ways to consume it, not just fully staged opera performances, which is kind of maybe the most typical way we think of consuming opera. Um, but there were also lots of opera excerpts that pervaded many arenas of popular culture, uh, vaudeville and film, you heard it in concerts, mixed with all kinds of other styles of music, not only classical music, but also popular music, the whole world of sheet music and recordings that were all different ways for people to engage with opera. And also a whole world of little known cheap opera or popular price opera that were fully staged productions, but that were aimed at um, audiences of the working class, Italians and Jews as well, but we'll be talking about that today. In short, um, opera is really um, all over the place in early 20th century America, not only in part of mainstream culture, but also as part of the culture of ethnic minorities, including obviously, as I mentioned, Italians who were famous for being opera lovers, uh, Germans, as well as Eastern European Jews, including the often very poor immigrants who came here in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
So today we're going to look at uh, the presence of opera specifically in this rich minority cultural sphere of Eastern European Yiddish speaking Jewish immigrants. Um, and at the end of the talk, we'll consider the confluence of cultural forces that uh, led to, or that drove Yiddish speakers' interest in opera at this particular cultural moment. So when they came to America, how did Yiddish speakers experience opera? As I mentioned, there were fully staged full length productions in Italian and Yiddish. Uh, there were certainly the elite opera performances at the Met, which we, and the Manhattan Opera, which was run by Oscar Hammerstein. And we know that many Jews did, in fact, attend the popular price nights or the standing room at these elite opera houses, sort of on the margins. Um, but they also went to these popular price productions that I mentioned, many of them of which, many of which were on the Lower East Side that were specifically aimed at both Italian immigrants and Jewish immigrants. Those were very affordable. Uh, I've given other talks, maybe some of you've heard them, uh, talked in more detail about these different opera companies, including the Abramson Opera Company, uh, there was Hammerstein's Educational Opera, um, there was an opera singer I'll talk about a little bit later, Mikhail Medvedev, who was involved in these productions, also the Zuro Opera Company, those were all in foreign languages, usually Italian, sometimes French, occasionally in German as well. And then we also have evidence that Yiddish speakers attended productions in English. Uh, the Castle Square Opera run by Henry Savage was a massive outfit, traveled all across the country. We know some people went to that. The Century Opera, which is an offshoot of the Metropolitan Opera, part of a complicated battle for supremacy between the Met and the Manhattan run by Hammerstein. There was even an all-black opera company called the Theodore Drury Grand Opera Company, which not only performed on the Lower East Side, there were ads in Yiddish papers for them, but there was even um, some Yiddish opera singers performed together with the black singers who were visiting. So there's a, there a lot of uh, cultural mixing going on here. There are also some fully staged modified productions of opera in Yiddish. There was a, several productions in 1897 of Il Trovatore. And then Moisha Hurwitz, who was one of the biggest playwrights of popular Yiddish operettas in the late 19th century. Uh, he put on a whole season of opera in Yiddish translation in 1904. They did not only Trovatore, which was very popular, um, but also Carmen, Faust, Rigoletto, kind of the, the old favorites. Um, Yiddish speakers also would have heard a little bit later in the 1920s, they would have heard um, arias and abridged productions on the radio. There was a, uh, in 1929, there was something called the Robert Burns Yiddish Hour, and they did abridged operas in Yiddish. And there were, of course, also many opportunities for Yiddish speakers to read about opera in the press. There were books of synopses of opera libretti in, in Yiddish. There were many, many articles in newspapers and magazines, um, sometimes reviews, sometimes biographies. Uh, Tomaszewski, Boris Tomaszewski, was one of the biggest stars of the Yiddish theater. He, in 1909, started a special newspaper that featured uh, topics specifically on theater and opera, and they had lots and lots of articles. Um, and there was a whole series on opera performance technique and comparing the merits of Caruso versus Bonchi. Supposedly there was there were a lot of heated discussions over who was better. So there's a lot of a lot of interest um, in a lot of um, areas of Yiddish speaking cultural life. And of course, there were excerpts, uh, as I mentioned, both in mainstream circles and in specifically Jewish circles. So certainly, as I mentioned, you know, we know that Yiddish speakers experienced opera in some mainstream environments, but I'll focus today on the specifically Jewish ones uh, that that they would have heard them in and seen them in because that is something that, you know, while there were a few outside observers who came to these things, um, this was mainly, really mainly aimed at Yiddish speakers. So um, today I'm going to talk about, talk about four main categories of opera aimed at Yiddish speakers. There were individual arias, either live or recorded. There were orchestral excerpts um, in concert. We also hear operatic, the operatic style and quite explicit often quotations of opera in the Yiddish theater. And also there, are, there were many sheet music arrangements of famous operatic moments. I'll consider each of these in turn. So for the first category, individual arias um, that were performed um, both um, in kind of more serious toned concerts, I'm calling them highbrow, and also ones that had a more popular bent um, and also on recordings. These were performed by both opera singers and cantors. Uh, sometimes, as many of you probably know, these opera singers became cantors. Cantors wanted to be opera singers. There was a whole world of tension uh, between the, the, the you know, non-religious world of operatic singing and 
the cantorial world. Um, many people have noted the similarity in singing style between cantorial singing and operatic singing, and many cantors did cross over. But especially at this time, um, the theater still had a kind of immoral tinge to it, a lot of um, you know, unsavory characters and, and questionable lifestyles that many people did not think were appropriate for a cantress to be involved in. So um, we'll, we'll talk about some of that a little bit later. But in any case, um, this is just a list of a few singers I'm going to talk about who were um, opera singers um, and cantors who sang some of these, some, sang some of these operatic excerpts live and in, con in concert and on recording. So one of them was Mikhail Medvedev, who was a Russian Jewish opera singer. That was not his real name. He was real name was, um, his last name um, was uh, was very Jewish, <laughs> um, Bernstein. And, uh, but he changed his name like so many opera singers, and so many artists at the time in order to be able to um, have a career in a mainstream career, which was closed to, to many Jews, to most Jews. So they changed their names so they could uh, they could succeed and succeed. He did. He knew Tchaikovsky. He premiered um, some of the roles in um, in Queen of Spades and um, um, no, it's just the Queen of Spades. Sorry. And he came to the U.S. for a tour between 1898 and 1900, um, already kind of towards the end of his performing career. He performed lots of opera excerpts and also performed a lot in the Yiddish theater. Uh, and in his concerts in the United States, which he gave uh, quite a number of, he included many romances and arias from operas by, as you can see here, um, Baradin, Tchaikovsky, Glinka, Dorogomirsky, he also sang folk songs, which apparently really uh, moved the crowds that heard them. He also gave uh, sometimes concerts that had excerpts of whole acts from operas. So here they paired um, Pagliacci, which is, of course, a short opera with one act of Rubinstein's opera, Diamond. And as you can see from this ad here, they were clearly trying to target the Russian speakers um, among, among the Jews. Another singer who also performed opera excerpts for Yiddish speakers in America was the Russian Jewish baritone um, Joseph Vinogradov who had a lot of similar sort of similar career trajectory to Medvedev um, similar training, he even studied with the same, uh, one of the same teachers, Galvani. He also sang at the, um, in many opera performances in Russia, throughout the Russian empire, traveled a lot. And he came to the US in the 1920s um, and performed in many concerts, um, a few staged operas, but mostly excerpts of opera and folk music, as you can see here on this program. He also did a lot of work in the Yiddish theater and also became a cantor towards the end of his life. Um, this program that you see here is the Yiddish version and the English version is uh, typical of these concerts that he gave. He traveled um, really all over the US, um, mostly the East Coast, but he did he did venture farther afield as well. And it's very common uh, to include uh, excerpts of opera in these mixed genre concerts, which um, often had multiple performance as performers, as you can see here. He's certainly the, the headline, but he's been performing um, with, uh, well, obviously piano accompanist, but with also a violinist, Maurice Lenzer, in this case, there are lots of different people he performed with who performed usually arrangements or uh, popular classical pieces. Um, sometimes there are also other singers who were involved in the concerts, including Rosenblatt, whom we'll talk about in a moment. So this concert is typical not only of Vinogradov's repertoire, um, but also just of the general genre of these kinds of concerts that people gave that mixed not only opera, but also classical music, as I mentioned, um, as well as Jewish liturgical music, Yiddish folk songs, as I said, and sometimes even popular American songs. Vinogradov didn't usually sing them, it was usually the other person, but definitely a, a real generic mix, um, you know, quote unquote highbrow and more popular, Jewish, religious and mainstream. Here he's singing, Vinogradov is singing pretty much all his standard op arias that he sang in these concerts. Um, he gave the arias, he sang the arias from Meyer Beer's La Friken, as you can see here, maybe you can from Afrikanka, which is kind of the, the way that um, Russian speakers, Yiddish speakers would have referred to the opera. And he's singing that one in Italian, even though, of course, it was origin originally written in French, sang aria from uh, Queen of Spades, Pika Vaidama, which he sang in Russian. He also sang his signature aria from Rossini's Barber of Seville, Figaro's famous Cavatina, which he sang in the Yiddish version and recorded, which we'll hear in a little bit. And that was something he sang, I think, at pretty much every concert that I found a program for anyway. Uh, he also sang, Vinogradov also sang opera in very clearly popularly oriented concerts. 
and there was a whole sort of mini tour he did with Joseph Chernyavsky and his Yiddish American jazz band, which are you know a fascinating kind of cultural hybrid. Uh, they're you know they play. You can get these recordings on YouTube. It's, it's fascinating. You know they they're you know popular music, sort of a jazz tinge, but it also has the sort of characteristic um, Jewish feel. And they played a whole range of repertoire, as you can see here in this mixed concert. Um, tickets were pretty cheap. Uh, you know, fifty cents. You know, was typical for um, concerts that included you know, working class audiences as well. So this is not at all an exclusive thing. And they're playing in the North High School Auditorium. It's not a not a fancy venue at all. You can see here the repertoire includes again this you know mix of classical music as a piano soloist. There was some dramatic declamations from the Yiddish theater, and then some um, popular tunes from um, just general popular Jewish music, and also from the Yiddish theater, some klezmer. And then um, Vinogradov sang some Yiddish folk songs, sang his Figaro aria, some some religious music. Uh, so it's really um, you know a, a lot of a lot of different things he mixed together that, from our present day perspective, probably seem a little bit um, a little bit surprising. But um, at this time, we're not thought of as being aesthetically or thought of as being aesthetically compatible. So here, let's listen to a little bit from his recording of the Yiddish version of Rossini's Barbara of Seville, his Figaro's aria. So I'm gonna get a little bit here. You can hear him do a little part of it. Pause it here. Anyway, there's, uh, it like so many things is on YouTube, so if you want to hear the rest of it, you certainly can. It's a lot of fun. So as I mentioned earlier, Vinogradov is, was like many opera singers at the time who, especially when they came to America, became canters as well. This cartoon um, is emblematic of that shift. Um, as you can see here, the, the caption um, re is from Der Grosse Kunis, which is a satirical Yiddish language magazine, May, May 1909. This cartoon says, in the old country, he was a canter and was called Zilikovich. In America, he is an Italian tenor and it's called Signor Zilconini. So the transformation, um, you know, it's evident here. And as I said, you know, it was a, there, there's, there's too much overlap. There's too much um, to talk about on the topic of cantors and opera to discuss here. There were no fewer than three Jewish tenors who were referred to as the Jewish Caruso. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of ferment in that. Um, but just briefly, uh, here is a cartoon also from the same um, humorous humorous magazine that shows the Kandri Yosla Rosenblatt, who is a massive superstar. I mean, it's kind of hard for us to envision that, I think, because these um, people who were in this in the cantorial world, in the opera world, uh, don't seem so superstarish for the most part. Um, but they were real um, sort of major public celebrities, both in Europe and, and in America. There was a real, um, they had, many of them had massively um, just massive popular followings and were known um, far and wide through their performances and through their through live performances and concerts and they toured widely and recordings. Uh, and here there was a lot of controversy in 1918 when Josla Rosenblatt um, 
was offered uh, by the Chicago Opera to perform in La Juive, which, you know, as far as opera go, operas go, this is pretty appropriate. Um, but again, as I mentioned, you know, the opera, the theater in general had uh, connotations of moral impropriety. So after much uh, hesitation, uh, much conflict, um, Rosenblatt declined the offer. Um, but it was a lot of, there was a lot of um, news coverage of it. And so he, you can see him running from the indecent grand opera maiden, re reads Yosler, grabs his prayer book and runs to synagogue. So decides to stay in the, in the religious world, although he did um, record many, many um, genres of music, not just liturgical music, but also some opera. But he did not perform on stage. That was the major difference. You could sing the music um, even in a theater, in a you know, in a concert setting, um, as long as you weren't pretending to be somebody else and associated with the world of actors and actresses, which was kind of the bigger the bigger problem. Uh, here are some just as you can see some of the newspaper coverage of the major concert that another cantor, Gershon Sirota, gave um, at Carnegie Hall in 1912. Um, he also he also toured, but this was kind of the big, um, you know, the big performance. Um, as I mentioned, Rosenblatt, sorry, not Rosenblatt, um, Sirota performed, um, as you can see here, um, opera excerpts. He famous sang the famous aria from Verdi's Aida, Celeste Aida. Also in this concert, he sang an ex excerpt from Haydn's Oratorio, and there were other singers um, who sang opera excerpts, and there was an organist apparently. So there's a lot of, um, again, a lot of this, this genre mixing um, and um, overlap between the cantorial and, and operatic worlds. So here we're going to listen to a little bit of Sirota singing uh, Verdi's Celeste Aida, which as he sang in that concert, you can see here, I, I found two photos that <laughs> side by side look just like that cartoon. Um, it's the, uh, the top hat um, versus the, the talus and the cantorial garb. Fast forward just a little bit so you can hear him doing the. There he goes. I'll pause it there. You can hear why these guys were in demand to sing opera. And these things, you know, they these records definitely sold very well, the operatic records as well as the religious ones. And often they, you know, sang, um, you know, they had multiple genres of music on the same same records. Uh, here, oh, just because I couldn't resist, here's a little bit of uh, another one of the other Jewish Caruso's singing. Um, this is actually a Yiddish version of um, Rachel Grand du Seigneur from La Juive from 1921. Um, uh, so here's another you know, record that Yiddish speakers would have purchased and listened to in their homes. Oh, my heart. 
I'll pause it there, even though it's so beautiful. All right, moving on. So the second category of opera excerpts that Yiddish speakers would have heard that were aimed specifically at them were these concerts that included orchestral operatic excerpts, uh, mostly formal concerts, but also in popular contexts, which I'll show you in just a moment. Occasionally they did have a vocal soloist, but for the most part, these were predominantly orchestral um, bits from operas. Uh, here you see an ad from an, from an 1896 concert at the Hebrew Institute, um, which as you can see, they tell you corner of Jefferson, Jefferson Street and East, East Broadway, so you know, right on the heart of the Lower East Side, New York City. There were many such concerts, um, as you can see here, uh, the seats are only 10 cents, which was very cheap. Even the the Yiddish theater performances, which were massively popular among the working class audiences, those the cheapest tickets to those, to those performances were 25 cents and lots and lots of people could afford those. So this is even cheaper than that. <laughs> and you'll notice also something which is you don't ever see in the Yiddish theater ads, at least not, not, not that I've ever seen, is that as you can see for the poor, you can attend for free, you just have to see the superintendent. So it's really, these concerts are open to everybody. Um, I wish we knew how many people paid and how many people didn't, but in any case, that's one of those things lost to history. Uh, this this uh, particular program is representative of the many, many ads for similar concerts that were going on in 1896 through 1898, at least, and probably more. These are the ones that I've I've come upon so far. And it also, these concerts often feature a mix of genres here. Um, this particular one had um, some operetta, the overture to Offenbach's Orpheus. Um, and then there's, you know, regular opera, Weber's Freischutz Overture, and Invitation to the Dance, but then you also get solo classical music, Rubinstein's Melody in F, Chopin's Funeral March, and then stuff, stuff from more opera, Gounod's Faust, and from Pagliacci. You're probably seeing a pattern here, there's kind of a, probably seven or eight operas that are the most uh, most popular ones that are, that are typically performed, not only for Yiddish speakers, but also kind of in the mainstream world, there's kind of a, a relatively narrow band of things that people want to listen to. Um, a few weeks later, I don't have, the, I'm not putting up the ad because there's just too many of them, but I'll just tell you there was a similar concert advertised and the multiple papers ran these ads. This one, the particular one from following week, um, featured bits from Meredith Il Trovatore, Rossini's Semiramide Overture, uh, some soupe, and then violin pieces. Um, also pieces by Rubinstein and Mendelssohn, who notably were Jewish composers. They Although they featured composers you know, of, of many nationalities, there was a bit of a bias to promoting Jewish composers when they could. Um, in March 1897, there was the concert featured almost exclusively opera excerpts. And why that's interesting is that the ad bills that particular concert, the repertoire for that concert as consisting of the most requested pieces from the season, which I find interesting because it suggests that the pieces that people most wanted to hear were the opera pieces, if we believe what the newspapers say, which, well, we can decide what, whether we believe them or not. Um, Yiddish speakers also heard orchestral operatic excerpts at politically sponsored events in his book Tenement Songs. Mark Slobin has uh, some shows some interesting ads that he came upon from the Yiddish papers there that show the many many different cultural uh, events that were going on in this time. Um, and there was an organization called the Bund, which is a prominent and also controversial political organization that um, wanted to help the Russian Jews fight against the oppression of the Tsarist regime. And they sponsored lots of political slash cultural events um, to promote their cause and to get people on board. Um, this particular 1904 concert um, from December, New Year's Eve, featured um, some sung operatic music by Hillel Vichnin, who incidentally also translated several um, opera librettos into Yiddish uh, that were published in these little booklet form for 10 cents each in 1908. Um, I think only a few were published, but he definitely had grand plans for publishing more. So we don't know what stopped him from doing it, but there was there was definitely um, the perception of interest um, in the value of promoting opera for Yiddish speakers. And these were you know detailed libretti, like you know the whole the whole thing, along with some um, uh, some biographical information about the composer and some the performance history. So it was a real kind of educational kind of thing, as well as you know promoting the entertainment aspect of it as well. Um, so this concert also featured not only the, the sung bits, but also a violinist playing arrangements of opera, arias, and some dramatic declamations, and of course a ball, which was, um, you know, that was the thing to do back in the day. Uh, you also, Yiddish speakers would have heard similar um, orchestral operatic excerpts at these popular concerts. This is an ad from 1906. 
for Picnic and Wonderful Concert, also sponsored by that same Bund organization um, in Liberty Park. Um, so definitely kind of a, a fun summer event where you, you know, you're, you're eating outside and then you're listening to um, bits from Faust and Mazeppa and Carmen. I don't know what the other overture and poet and peasant are, but in any case, um, there are also some opera excerpts that I didn't I didn't put here in the in the translation. And tickets here a little more expensive, twenty cents, but this is already ten years later. Um, but in any case, um, opera is everywhere. <laughs> you also would have heard they would have heard operatic music at funerals, um, at the Yiddish playwright Jacob Gordon's funeral in nineteen oh nine. The um, some group of musicians played the Pilgrim's Chorus from Wagner's Tannhäuser. So the third major category of opera excerpts that Yiddish speakers would have heard would have been in the context of the Yiddish theater. There's so much of this, so much in fact that the Yiddish theater composer and conductor, Joseph Rumshinsky, lamented this bitterly. He complained um, that these uh, Yiddish theater composers, people like Perlmutter and Vol, were taking operatic music, what he, the way he put it was shikervise, you know, in bits and pieces from the most popular uh, European operas, which annoyed the elites tremendously because they knew these operas really well and they were, um, they found it off-putting, I guess, to hear, you know, arias and um, orchestral bits from operas taken out of their context and um, completely changed around, adapted. But for most audiences, uh, they appear not to have been bothered by this. Um, in any case, they, they would have been hearing a lot of this, op not only the operatic style, but also sometimes explicit quotations. Um, how much they were aware of where these things were coming from, we don't know. But they definitely heard lots of operatic music in the Yiddish theater. So just I have just a very few examples, and there are many, many more. Um, Goldfad the Shulamis features a lot of Italian operatic style. Goldfad himself spent a lot of time attending the uh, mainstream theater throughout Russia. So he he knew um, the music of operetta, the music of opera, and so he has absorbed a lot of this along with lots of liturgical music as well, of course. Um, Ron Roboy has written about how Latinos Alexander, Crown Prince of Jerusalem, has a lot of Italian opera in it as well. Um, recent research from the Dybbuk Project um, that I've been a part of uh, that was um, done by Ruthie Abelievich and others on the project um, in reconstructing Latinos Der Dybbuk, which is sort of the antecedent to, um, to Ansky's later, more famous one. There's a, there's a, a number in there which is verbatim from the Barber of Seville, um, the, the famous uh, the famous one of the famous parts from the overture. Well, I guess the whole overture is famous, but the, one of the more famous parts anyway from that. There's no question they were quoting it, but it doesn't really seem to fit the context. So they just thought it sounded kind of, you know, fun and um, I guess create a kind of agitated atmosphere. So they just threw it in there. Um, and also from research that I've done with Ruthie, as part of the Dybbuk project, there's lots of, we've come upon lots of Italian operatic music and quotations in um, Horvitz's Ben Hador, another one of these popular operettas from the time. So look, look a little bit, in detail each of these just briefly. Um, here's a quotation from La Traviata. Slobin also talks about this in his Tenement Songs. Um, from You can see the second line shows um, Goldfaden's adaptation of um, Traviata's, uh, Violetta's famous aria from La Traviata, A Forza Louis. Um, and then this um, Joseph uh, Levine also shows how this melody found its way probably through Goldfaden into, um, into some uh, synagogue music as well. So there's a lot of um, blending of musical styles and melodies across genres and contexts. Uh, here we'll listen just a little bit from Goldfaden and Shulamis. Um, Regina Prager is a big star of the Yiddish theater. She actually had some operatic training and might have followed the world of, um, followed her career into the world of opera, could have, but um, you know, she didn't want that um, you know, the immoral associations of the theater. So she decided to stay in the Yiddish theater, which is probably good for the Yiddish theater because she's a wonderful singer. So here's a little bit for you to, to hear um, the sound of um, Italian opera in the uh, Yiddish theater. Here it comes.
pause out there. That too is all publicly available um, in uh, through the University of Wisconsin libraries. All right, moving on. Uh, there is more Italian opera in um, Ben Hador by Horvitz. I mentioned before this March, which is probably not probably it was one of the three most frequently excerpted parts of the operetta. It was recorded. It was on piano rolls and the sheet music here. Um, very clearly draws on uh, Verdi's Il Trovatore, the anvil chorus, um, not only rhythmically, um, but also um, in the uh, the melody, the intervals, the phrase structure, even that trill at the beginning. Um, it's, you know, whether they were doing this paramotor and vol, the composers were doing this consciously or not, it definitely has the Italianate style and recalls that kind of energy. And of course, the Italian opera would have had an association for the audiences with sort of grandness, impressiveness, um, you know, big dramatic spectacle. And so when in the operettas, you know, they wanted to create that kind of grand sense, Italian opera was the go-to um, musical language and style that they would have would have chosen. Um, here later in the march, there's um, a, a version that the, in the lyrical theme, it sounds very much like um, Alfredo and Violetta's duet, Um di Felice, Herma Traviata. Um, pretty unmistakable. Most people probably would have recognized it, but, you know, it's close enough. There is there is an, opera, you know, romantic um, love interest in the um, in the operetta, it, it, it worked fine. <laughs> um, and I don't have this here, but also there are lots of instances where the female protagonist, the princess, uh, sings this very bel canto style of fioritura. It sounds a lot like Casta Diva to me from Bellini's Nora, but it, you know, it really could, it could come from pretty much anywhere. It's that, that kind of musical language. So here's a little bit from the duet uh, from Ben Hador uh, that, um, that shows the Italian style. Um, and he, at, at the very end of, of the uh, of the first phrase that the that the um, that Alumis, the the female protagonist sings, you'll hear something that sounds to me very much like the Bring to See the Drinking Song from Traviata. So here's just a little bit of that. I'll pause it here then. You know, the, the grand hero tenor comes in and they sing, he sings his bit, and then the whole structure of the duet is very much like Italian um, opera duets where she sings, he sings, they sing together. There, then there's a the grand kind of cabaletta, the very faster, faster part where it kind of ends in this breathless conclusion. So, um, even structurally, you can see the Italian style. As I mentioned before, you know, some of these uh, kinds of things. You know these these styles, this Italian style, and the quotations would have been um, familiar to audiences. So maybe some of them did recognize it as some Troviata, but even if they didn't, they clearly were familiar enough with the um, the sort of the semiotic conventions of this music. So when they hear what we call the Italian operatic style, they understood that it was Italian opera and that it had those kind of associations. Um, of grandness and and um, so you know this is the the royal characters the ones who sing opera and the the servant characters definitely don't don't sing any opera so even just um, you know character wise um, that kind of style was was um, understood by audiences very clearly. Okay, so last uh, major category of opera excerpts for Yiddish speakers specifically would have been sheet music, um, things people could play themselves in their homes. There's a whole world of commercial cheap sheet music for Yiddish speakers, mostly of um, excerpts of the most famous numbers from the most popular operettas. So here in particular, you can see on the left side, this is the um, this is the, the front for 
on the front page that is for what the sheet music is. It's uh, from music from Corpus's operetta, um, The Widow from 1908. Um, and then at the back, there were often ads for um, sometimes, um, usually music, but also sometimes for um, other other kinds of things associated with other, you know, scripts and things for the Yiddish theater. Uh, but most of these were, you know, easy piano music or piano arrangements, sometimes also for violin, violin and piano, also sometimes for man the violin part, you know, could have been for mandolin as well, um, for people to play in their homes. But what's interesting is on the back of this, um, while most often you see ads for popular Yiddish operas, in this case you see um, ads for Il Trovatore and La Traviata, these quite simplified arrangements of the most, some of the more popular um, moments from these operas. And even below there, you can see they're still advertising, uh, you know, by also, maybe you also might like these, uh, these pieces from other popular Yiddish operettas. So definitely, as you can see, sort of a mix of, of these uh, Yiddish theater and the, and opera, part of this broader cultural package. And the fact they're advertising operas for, at these things that they're marketing for people who go to the Yiddish theater suggests that, people who like the Yiddish theater, you know, some of them um, would also have been potentially interested in in playing um, opera in their home. Um, certainly the more, it's only the more affluent people who would have had, you know, among the uh, Yiddish speakers who would have had pianos. Um, but as was, as was the case with, um, with phonographs, um, you could buy pianos on installment. So they were um, a surprisingly larger contingent of people than you might expect would have been able to afford a piano if they really wanted one. Uh, so this is just one example from 1908, but there also there's sheet music that I've found from 1912 um, that include on the back page. These were in this particular one I found um, had it was sheet music by Herman Shapiro, which included a Russian waltz and Jewish wedding songs. So you know, kind of general interest music. Um, but at the back page, they're on the back page, they're advertising classical pieces for piano, which included an arrangement by Rumshinsky of all people, though he was in definitely interested in, in opera and kind of wanted to elevate the Yiddish theater to a more operatic state. But that's topic for another time. Um, anyway, at the, at the this sheet music from 1912, there was an uh, easy piano music arrangement they were advertising from um, La Juive. Um, that same thing was being advertised in 1914. Um, there are also other Yiddish theater music from 1908 that has an ad for Fantasia on an air from Tomas's opera Raymond, which is not an opera that anyone hears pretty much anymore today, but that was um, popular at the time. Um, sheet music for Latiner Operetta in 1912 also advertises uh, the aria and Brindisi. Uh, again, the Raymond Overture as part of classical pieces, easy for young students, which suggests also that there is a kind of idea. This is the kind of music that you know people should learn if they want to uh, kind of you know rise up in the world and be um, you know become more educated. Um, I should say also that this you know sheet music featuring operatic excerpt has a long history in America, um, you know as early as the 1850s and um, maybe even a little bit earlier, but certainly by the 1850s and, you know, for the rest of the 19th and into the early 20th century, there were tons of these uh, cheap sheet music excerpts from operas. You can see here stars from the operas. This is this, so it has the idea del Posada, which is the very same aria we saw advertised in the 1908 sheet music I showed you a moment ago. This one is from 1954 though, it's not 1854. And this is in addition to um, Traviata, uh, there are also, you can, you could buy um, bits from piano arrangements of arias from Meyerbeer, of Les Ugino by Meyerbeer, from uh, more Dorizetti, um, and then of course Tannheis, Tannhäuser as well. I say of course, but there's, Wagner for Yiddish speaker is also another topic um, we could talk about another day, but not today. In any case, this Yiddish theater commercial sheet music world um, was specifically, with opera acts, was specifically targeting Yiddish speakers, but it was part of this broader um, American trend of making opera accessible um, to the general public through these easy arrangements for piano. So I just want to close in the last couple of minutes with some thoughts about you know what all is, what does all this mean? What did opera signify for Yiddish speakers in early 20th century America? What do we what do we under how do we understand all these um, you know bits of historical data? Um, to me, all of these experiences that Yiddish speakers in America would have had to opera bring to light the multiple functions and meanings um, opera can have simultane simultaneously, both within social groups and across social groups. So, so for Jewish immigrant audiences in particular, opera certainly, maybe on the most basic level, signified entertainment, as it did for so many other people. It was a um, big spectacle. You know, now we have you know, movies and you know these grand you know Cirque du Soleil, these big shows, um, but 
you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, opportunities for us to see grand spectacle, but at the time, you know, in the early 20th century, that didn't really exist. So, if, you know, especially if you were a working class immigrant, um, if you wanted to see a big show, you had to go to the theater and opera was sort of the biggest show there was. Um, so, um, you know, the stars were featured on the front pages of not only Yiddish newspapers, but also mainstream newspapers. Um, sometimes if there was a big, a big um, scandal, that was something that people would have heard lots about. You know, these were, as I said, these were celebrities, glitz and glamour. And of course, um, opera also had a long legacy of being popular in the United States, um, not only in Italian, but also and maybe especially in English in the vernacular at popular prices. For Jews, opera also signified something a little bit different, which was assimilation and acceptance into the modern European cultural mainstream. Um, this was something that was important for a lot of people, especially um, is coming out of the legacy of the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, and the um, early 19th century, where religious communities were trying to find ways of, some people in religious communities wanted to integrate more with the mainstream. Opera was a strong signifier of um, refined uh, mainstream culture, and so familiarity with that showed your um, so your, your assimilation bona fides, I guess, in a way. Um, and then in the United States in particular, um, so the emergence uh, you know, of this, the specifically um, you know, Jewish oriented Yiddish speakers, um, socialist uh, movement that came from um, you know, Russian Jewish intellectuals who had come over from the, uh, from the Russian empire, brought with them some of those European ideals of Bildung and Aufklärung um, that were kind of built into this broader political ideology. And part of that, um, the, you know, the, the call to pe encourage people to rise up and stand up for themselves and better their condition and, and be strong. Um, part of that worldview included the idea that they should be, um, you know, enlightened, refined citizens and opera played into that part of, part of played into that ideology as well. Um, and finally, um, sort of tied into this as well was the idea that opera represented a kind of refinement and respectability um, not only in Europe, but maybe even especially in the United States, where there was a particularly um, American version of um, building, which was referred to as cultural uplift um, as part of the progressive era in the late 19th, early 20th century, where promoters, um, mostly the upper middle class and the elites, thought that um, encouraging people to become more familiar with quote unquote high culture, of which opera was definitely a part, would contribute to creating a more integrated and um, unified cultural social fabric, which was especially pressing issue at the time because there were so many ways of immigration and trying to find ways of incorporating um, these immigrants into the mainstream America. So one way of doing that was opera and they already liked opera. So it was a particularly good way of, of bringing people in. Uh, so for Jews, as for everybody, opera really straddled this highbrow and popular uh, sphere and also straddled the old and the new worlds. Um, and I think this is the final point I'll make about this, and I think it's the most interesting thing about looking at these cultural forms from um, diff at different time periods and from different perspectives, it reminds us that the meanings of any given form of culture change across time, and they mean different things for different people um, at different times. Maybe that seems like an obvious point, but, you know, as this, this sort of glimpse into the past shows us, you know, opera was not necessarily just kind of for rich people or for elites. Um, it really had a vibrant, um, popular life as well. Um, and I think it reminds us that, um, you know, that we can think about our understanding of culture in the present um, in a more nuanced way by remembering that, you know, these things have their, bring their legacies of associations. And it also reminds us that, you know, the same, very same form of culture can have very different meanings for different people, even in the same time period. So I think it's something we can bring to our, um, our understandings of our present cultural environment. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It's been so fascinating. We have a lot of great questions, so we'll just dive right in. Um, one question, just to kind of like zoom out the frame a little bit. Um, you mentioned these different ethnic groups and immigrant groups that were really interested in opera and had their own kind of relationship to it. Uh, Italian immigrants, German immigrants, um, the African-American community as well. Was there anything unique about um, the Yiddish uh, interest in opera or is this best seen as you know another kind of um, an analog to those groups? It's a really good question. I think part of it is certainly very much like those other groups. I mean, there was a lot of collaboration between the Italians and the Jews in promoting these endeavors. And they also, especially someone like Abramson, wanted to open it up, uh, these affordable opera performances that were also very high quality, but at cheap prices, um, to include not only Jews and Italians, but also Americans. 
so in that sense, kind of the, the the broader entertainment sphere and the sort of the higher class at affordable prices was part of the same thing. For Jews, I think it was special on two levels. One, the kind of assimilation story, the the idea that Jews were always a marginal group, um, and sort of trying to find ways of, um, of, of of you know blending into mainstream mainstream society, at least in certain circumscribed ways. Opera was one way of doing that. But also, especially in the United States, because opera was a form of quote unquote highbrow culture already at this time, um, sort of enshrined with the establishment of the Metropolitan Opera in, in um, 1883, opera had a kind of um, educational tinge to it. At least people perceived it as something that you could be educated and then that would be somehow who make you somehow make you a more refined um, an enlightened person. And that fit in with the specifically Jewish aspiration or an important Jewish aspiration at the time among immigrants to, to become educated, to learn um, not just about you know, American culture, but also about sort of the broader world of European culture, which is sort of a legacy of the, you know, as I mentioned, of the, the, the building ideas of Europe, but in the United States, it was also institutionalized. There were organizations like not only the Hebrew Institute, but also the Educational Alliance um, and other settlement houses that promoted these kinds of educational opportunities. So there were lectures on all manner of things, you know, on civics, on history, on science, um, you know, on music, um, and that was part of this um, this uh, this move to educate Jewish immigrants. And so that is sort of had fit into that kind of educational field as well for Jews. Um, so speaking of this idea of opera as a kind of like educated or elevated medium. And you, you mentioned this idea of Rumshinsky's ambition of elevating elevating the Yiddish theater to the level of opera. Um, but given the strong connection between operetta and Italian opera, Yiddish operetta and Italian opera, um, how exactly do you parse this difference between what we call opera and what we call operetta? Are these things more intertwined than that terminology allows? Or is there a, a way to draw that line? I think when someone like Rumshinsky is talking about opera, um, and I think still today, we distinction we typically draw is that, um, you know, opera is something that's sung all the way through. There's no spoken dialogue, whereas operetta has musical numbers, but also kind of like the broader musical also has um, lots of spoken dialogue. So I think that's the main distinction. Um, uh, I think, you know, I don't know if Romchinsky ever thought that he was going to be able to write, you know, I mean, there are people who wrote Yiddish operas for sure, you know, operas in Yiddish that were sung throughout. Um, I think he was too uh, savvy a, a person in the theater world to to realize to you know to try to do something that was just going to not have any dialogue um but i think that it's, it's not and that's the most obvious generic distinction but i think also stylistically um the kind of kind of sophistication maybe musically that that he strove to 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 incorporate into his operettas um, you know some thematic sophistication blending you know having musical themes like you know, wagnerian um overtones you could say um, so having light motifs i mean actually <laughs> it's a funny article um I forget which newspaper now, but um, Rumshinsky's or um, some his orchestral, orchestral musicians apparently referred to him as Crazy Wagner because he was trying to sort of build the orchestra into a more, um, not just a bigger entity, but also not just more musical sophistication and complexity, but also having it in a more sophisticated um, um, sort of right. interaction with the singers on stage. So mm -hmm. um, I think those are some of the ways that they're, um, they could be blended despite okay. the, the spoken distinction. A very quick aside, we're doing a project at EVO, which everyone stay tuned for for next season and beyond, about Rumshinsky's show Shir Hashirim, um, which is a, a different show than the, the one with the Shir Hashirim song from Dialmona that you pointed out. Um, but we, but in any case, the one of the main characters in that show is an opera composer. So it's just kind of an interesting data point in all of this. Um, okay, so a lot, a lot of other interesting questions here. Um, you, you showed them uh, Vinogradov um, and the, some of the songs that he was singing. Um, and there's a specific question about this one uh, peak Dama aria. It was that performed in Russian, but maybe you could speak a little more broadly about this. Do you have any sense of why certain arias were performed in their original language and others were performed in translation? That's a good question. I think there are certain conventions in different cultures, uh, different national cultures. Uh, so for example, in, in Russia, all the Russian singers would have sung the Russian operas in Russian, obviously. <laughs> um, but there were other um, operas that had um, different traditions of being sung in different languages that there were not the original. So Meyerbeer, for example, was often sung in Italian um, as opposed to French. Um, I don't really know why. <laughs> um, maybe because Italian was easier to sing or that maybe the teachers, the opera teachers in Russia happened to have learned those 
operas in Italian because, you know, until, you know, really 50, 60 years ago um, in Europe, um, still operas were typically performed in the language of the audience. So if you were in Italy, you would have heard Wagner in Italian. If you were in Germany, you would have heard Verdi in German. Um, the idea that the, an, any opera should be performed in the language in which it was originally written um, is a relatively recent thing. I and mean, the Met was really among the first um, to do that and really only felt like in the early 1900s really it started. Um, so uh, I think the reason those particular ones are sung in those languages just has to do with the legacy of the particular, you know, historical quirks that led those to be performed that way. Um, you build this as uh, Yiddish speaking um, opera excerpts for Yiddish speakers in early 20th century America. Does this um, end at a certain point in the 20th century um, or does it shift? How would you kind of describe the the time uh, uh, kind of contours around this? Yeah, I mean, the time period is circumscribed mainly by just the presence of Yiddish speakers in America, which certainly, you know, experienced a dramatic drop off first in the 1920s um, with the restriction of immigration and then, of course, after the Holocaust. So um, there was certainly still some stuff in Yiddish in, into the late 1920s. Um, but um, after that point, there were just fewer Yiddish speakers and the ones who were here were already assimilating. So there were there were a lot of Jews, a lot of Jew, you know, children of Jewish immigrants who probably grew up speaking Yiddish, who were involved in the um, operatic world, many, many of them. Um, and in fact, one of the more prominent ones, Samuel Chutzenoff, was involved in putting the NBC opera on TV, which went on quite some years and was pretty successful. Like, that's the one that featured Amal and the Night Visitors became very famous for that. But they did, they did lots and lots of other ones in English. So there are a lot of these people who come out of this milieu who are very much invested in promoting opera. Um, Josiah Zura, who was um, involved with his father in promoting and in, in putting on these popular price performances of Italian opera, um, mostly in Italian, for Yiddish speakers on these Lower East Side theaters in the 19-teens, he himself um, was involved in a lot of educational efforts promoting opera, um, but, you know, in English-speaking um, environments, he was involved in movies, later went to Hollywood, so and there's a legacy of those people involved, ongoing legacy of people involved in the cultural world of opera and classical music more generally, and Hollywood, but not in Yiddish anymore because there wasn't enough of an audience for it. Fascinating. Um, you spoke about how um, cantors kind of were interested in, in opera and they were, to a certain degree. Um, and you also mentioned that some opera singers became cantors. That's some, is it, can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure, there's lots of interesting research um, by the people <laughs> who would speak much more um, in more detail um, to people like Judah Cohen and Mark Slobin, Jeffrey Chandler, I've um, written a lot on Josela Rosenblatt. So um, I think the only thing to say briefly is that there's people have noted the similarity in performance style and the kind of the breathing technique um, that cantors uh, used. So if you look at the history of cantorial singing in Europe, um, you know, from the, I guess, the mid 19th um, century and through the early 20th, um, it's full of stories of uh, cantors, you know, making a little extra money on the sly by singing with an opera company um, or cantors who almost signed with an opera company at the last minute changed their mind. So, um, it's always kind of a, a dangerous, uh, dangerous allure of opera for cantors, um, and some crossover, and then some found this, you know, balance of not performing on stage but making recordings. Um, so I think it's just it's a it's a, a world of tension with a lot of aesthetic commonality, um, but uh, complicated by the um, the immoral associations of the theater. Um, you had mentioned that there are a bunch of different tenors tenors that have been called the Jewish Caruso over the ages. Um, are there, could you share with us some of who that has been, or are they names that we might recognize? Sure, yeah, I talked about all of them. Um, Joseph Schliski, who we heard, whom we heard singing uh, that aria from La Juive, um, Gershon Sirota, whom we heard singing Chile uh, Aida, and uh, Rosenblatt, whom we heard, um, but we didn't, didn't hear him singing today, but he's also referred to as the Jewish Cruz. There's a Neil Levin in one of the articles from the uh, use of the Milken Archive has a great uh, anecdote about how Rosenblatt went to hear uh, John McCormick, the Irish uh, singer, in I think a concert in Tennessee or something, and uh, McCormack greeted him and said, you know, you know, I think Rosenblatt came came and to congratulate him on a on a great concert, and uh, McCormack referred to him. He said, oh, hello, um, the uh, let me get this right, Jewish McCormack, and Rosenblatt said, oh, hello, um, Irish Rosenblatt. So. Um, <laughs> 
was that kind of cultural exchange as well. Oh, wonderful. Um, we're just about out of time here. We have a bunch more really interesting questions, um, but maybe we'll end on this kind of more fun one. Um, one viewer asks, are you yourself a singer? And I'll just add to that. How, how do you, how did you find yourself um, interested in this topic? How did you get into it? Sure. I'm definitely not a singer and I spared you singing some of those little musical excerpts I, I had on stage. I'm a pianist. Um, I came to this through a footnote. I was literally a footnote. I was researching the, what was referred to at the time as Parsifalitis, the massive interest in Wagner's Parsifal that was occasioned in 1903 by the illicit performance by the Metropolitan Opera of Wagner's Parsifal, which was supposed to be only performed in Wagner's special um, town and opera house in Bayreuth in Germany, Bavaria. Uh, there was a lot of scandal over the fact that it had been performed in the United States and so this in at the Metropolitan Opera and so there was a whole world of popular Parsifals that emerged and I was reading an account of this and um, in Joseph Horowitz Wagner Nice, he had a footnote that said there was also a Yiddish version of Parsifal from the Lower East Side and I said, what? <laughs> a Yiddish Parsifal? That's so weird on so many levels. So I started digging um, and then, you know, I didn't know Yiddish at the time, so I was like, well, okay, first I had someone translate stuff to me, and I was like, that's not going to work. So I was like, okay, I have to learn Yiddish, so I went and learned Yiddish and started looking at these newspapers, and as I combed the newspapers, I found more ads for opera and Yiddish, and I said, what? They did Trovatore in Yiddish, and then one thing led to another, and here I am today. Fantastic. Well, well, we have to hear about Wagner and Yiddish another day. It sounds so interesting, and I'm, I'm really curious. Um, maybe you could just tell us before we close, uh, where can we learn more, uh, and how can we follow your work? I um, mean, you know, I have an article on Wagner's Parsifal in Yiddish, if you want to find that it's musical quarterly. Um, I think you have to pay for it. Um, <laughs> if you want to email me, I'll send you a copy. My email is, uh, you, know, you can find it online. Okay, um, yeah, and there's also, I have another article um, in a German journal, but it's in German. So if you want to, I have an English version, I'll send that to you too. So just write to me. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Um, we're so grateful that you shared the, your research with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be able to share it.